Hey, evening all. It's at six o'clock London time on the 3rd of September 2020. Welcome to This Week in 60 Minutes, brought to you by Spectator Television. Indeed, this is the inaugural broadcast of Spectator TV. Uh, there will probably be lots of technical hitches, but we hope you'll bear with us and that this will be the first of many to come. Thank you all for joining us on this special occasion for us. A special thanks to the NatWest Group, who are supporting this inaugural broadcast tonight. The NatWest Group is the biggest supporter of businesses across the UK and is working especially hard during the pandemic to do everything it can to help businesses and personal customers get through this period. We have assembled a star-studied cast from the uh, Spectator. Actually, we just locked the doors to make sure they couldn't get out until the broadcast went on air. We have the editor of The Spectator, Fraser Nelson, Katie Balls, the deputy political editor of The Spectator, and James Forsyth, the political editor of The Spectator. Our special guest tonight is Professor Carl Hennigan, director of the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine at the University of Oxford. We had tried to get someone uh, who was an expert in no evidence-based medicine, but Prince Charles wasn't available for us. So, Spectator TV launches today on the same day that Harry and Meghan announce a $100 million contract with Netflix. Uh, we're launching ours simply on a wing and a prayer. Harry and Meghan have promised, and I quote, impactful content that unlocks action. There you go. I just can't wait for more. We would simply be glad if you watched this and uh, absorb what we have to say. We don't mind if you want to sing Rule Britannia at the end or even during, feel free. We don't really care if you want to sing the red flag, uh, but just keep it to yourself. We want to cover some of the important topics uh, that have dominated the headlines this week. And I'm afraid that means we have to begin as every broadcast has to begin uh, in the past six months almost with COVID. Matt Hancock announced today that he's investing 500 million in trials for a 20 minute COVID-19 saliva test. It's part of a mass testing strategy. Now a lot seems to be riding on this scheme. The health secretary said that families may be able to hug each other at Christmas if a mass testing program is in place by then. Now the announcement came as weekly cases were revealed to be at their highest level since the end of May. This is fueled talk of a second wave, with cases in Spain, several other countries, including France, now rising. So will Britain be next? What does the data say? Let's go straight to Fraser Nelson. Thank you, Andrew. Well, our understanding of COVID has come a very long way since right at the start. I understand that ministers had no idea there was such a thing as an asymptomatic COVID case. Uh, later on, we should learn that as many as four in five cases can be asymptomatic. That puts a very different perspective when you see the number of cases rising. And it's far from clear what this necessarily means. Uh, we've had local lockdowns based on the fact that cases are rising. But we heard um, Graham Brady, Tory MP and chairman of the 1922 committee this morning, saying that you should be looking at other things like hospital admissions, because tests going up is not the full picture. Now, the first country to see this was Spain. And um, I'll show you here on, on the screen. You can see Spain's second wave. It's in blue. It's all quite clear. Um, it's going up almost as high as it was in the first peak. But what's significant is the deaths in Spain. While they followed cases quite heavily the first time around, the second time around, they haven't. Of course, there is a lag between the rise in cases and any potential rise in deaths, but it's not a lag that we've seen very much of so far. And this has been seen right around Europe. We also had um, Leo Varadkar, who's got a lot more time in his hands nowadays, pointing this out. He was pointing out all that in Ireland, you're getting a lot more positive tests, but with no illness, no hospital increases, no deaths, the same pattern across Europe. Um, now, this brings us to what's happening in Britain. These are our COVID cases. You mentioned earlier on, Andrew, that the, the levels now are at the highest since May. Well, this is what we're looking at, the people um, testing PCR positive to COVID. But then have a look at the number of people in hospital with COVID symptoms. That is a very different picture. It's going down steadily. There's no uptick in that at all. So what we're seeing is here, as with Spain, a strange decoupling of COVID cases 
and the serious illness, the hospitalizations that stem from the, those cases. When we look at the number of patients on ventilators, the very serious case, again, like the hospital cases, that is going down without any signs of increasing. So this um, raises interesting questions about how we diagnose the spread of COVID, what policymakers are supposed to do when they're thinking about whether to lock down a, a locality, a city, or a country. If you look at Bolton, where we, um, which thought it was going to be free from lockdown earlier this week, only to find out it wasn't. You can see the, um, the number of cases increasing there. That's what changed um, ministers' minds, as well as pressure from local authorities. But again, look at the hospital beds occupied. That data is lagging, but there's no sign yet of any increase in illness. So this is what takes us to a very interesting step in our stage, in our understanding of the pandemic. What should we be looking for? Should we be changing policy as our understanding of the data changes? And what indeed is that evidence telling us? Back to you, Andrew. Fraser, thanks for that. It's a very important development, which is why we're uh, leading with it tonight on Spectator TV. And the trend was pointed out in a Spectator article earlier this week about Carl Hennigan, professor at Oxford University's Evidence Based at Medicine Department. He joins me uh, now. Professor, thanks for being on this for us, a very special uh, broadcast. But it's an important issue, so I just want to try and untangle it a little bit. Explain to us how we could be having more cases, rising cases of COVID, and, and yet fewer fatalities, and even in some cases, fewer hospital cases. Right, let's try and be, it, it, this is a complex issue, but I think we can break it into sort of three areas. Let's go back to March, about March the 27th, we went into lockdown. We had a very significant increases in cases in a two week period, where we got to the peak of death around about the 8th to the 10th of April. And one of the issues about lockdown that was very clear is that actually disproportionately increased the risk in the very elderly and the care homes. All of the outbreaks in care homes came after lockdown. In an eight week period, 82% of care homes had infection outbreaks, about six and a half thousand. On average, they have about three deaths. So there's about 18,000 deaths immediately. You've, you've got, and actually as a consequence of lockdown, now, there are, we can discuss why that is, and there are really interesting issues about that. But the second aspect is, when people look at country comparisons, they say England's doing worse than Spain, or is slightly better than Belgium. But actually, one of the keys about the care home population is in the year before, we had a higher vulnerable population trending in. We had about 15,000 less deaths in 2019 in that population. So that means you've got a group of people hanging on by their fingernails, any respiratory pathogen who gets in that environment will be deleterious. So that's one aspect. The second aspect in pushing people into hospital, there was a phase where there was panic, high numbers of people going on to intensive care units and the mortality in ICU was so high, I've never seen a mortality that high. It was approaching 70, 80%, whereas for viral pneumonia, it should be 20%. So we've seen new treatments come on board. So that's two aspects where we're better prepared. But then if we move forward into the summer, what's happening now is we're seeing, and this is an interesting aspect, a normalization of the risk across the age groups. So as we come out of lockdown, what happens is as young people go about their lives, yeah, they get the infection. But one of the stunning things about this infection risk is under 50, your risk is virtually zero. Now, that's not the same for infections like RSV, influenza, which will affect young children, particularly under five. So we'd be much more worried if we were going back to schools now with children and influenza. The second aspect we've seen is what we're seeing is the viral load in individuals is less in summer. And data coming out of Italy suggests over 50% of the people testing positive are weak positives. So that's where you get the asymptomatics people who are potentially able to have their T-cell immunity fight off the disease. So that's two. And then I say the third issue, which is we are sort of in the trying to understand is our immunity and how it affects seasonally. People have put through ideas like vitamin D hypothesis, but also what happens as well is you're more vulnerable towards the end of the winter. You may have already had an infection. And one of the key bits of your immune system is your white cells is something called lymphocytes. And if they get worn down, you are in a bit of trouble. 
And that's the problem as you get older, you have this feature called immunosenescence where your T cells, your white cells are much harder to wake up. So across the board, I think putting all them three issues together, this is the problem I see across the board is we keep modeling and predicting what's going to happen next, as opposed to op reacting to what's actually happening now on the ground, which is what Fraser put out there. And if you do that, you should open up. And as we're doing is saying, look, let's get schools, universities open, but be vigilant while we do that. Is it too simple to say that most of the cases now have been discovered are among younger people and younger people are, as you said, less likely to die or even less likely to have the, the symptoms and that you can have more cases, but they're in a, a demographic uh, which doesn't suffer many fatalities uh, from COVID. So, so it is one argument that would explain some of it, but it doesn't explain all of the effect because we've seen data from other countries that suggest even in the over 85 year olds, their case fatality rate is plummeting. Mm -hmm. In fact, in the last month, we've still had in excess of 400 care home outbreaks. It's just not well publicized. And I can come back to that because that should be our priority in winter and it doesn't seem to be. But actually their fatality has dropped right down. And one of that is about the idea of a susceptible population out there for viruses is some group of people who will be, who will, who will die in effect, even if they get the common cold. So it, they have to be shielded in effect. So I think it's one argument that the risk is down, but it doesn't explain all of the effect that we're seeing. The figures Fra Fraser gave are interesting that, that it didn't show uh, much of an uptick, if any uptick in hospitalizations which is a, an interesting development, more cases, but not more people, the health service not being overwhelmed by any means by it. But in France and Spain, which many people think are maybe several weeks ahead of us in these cycles, uh, they have a rise in cases, and there is now in Spain and France an uptick in hospitalizations, not dramatic, but is rising. Should we be worried about that? So there are interesting aspects about societies well if you think of france and spain they had very hard lockdowns spain in effect you couldn't you had to have a pass i believe to go out of the house you had to stay in children same, france. same in france you had to fill same in a form france. to leave for an hour so it's a really interesting the first aspect is to say what happens when you open up when you've got very low immunity in a population and that's what we're seeing these sporadic outbreaks because the real anom anomaly is london You've got 10 million people. Rishi's scheme has had over 100 million people eat out in the restaurants and the pubs. There are 47,600 pubs in this country. About 40 million people have been through them. So why in somewhere like London or in these areas haven't you seen outbreaks like Italy and Spain? So I think their immunity is very low. So as you open up, remember, everybody's forgotten, flatten the curve. In effect, if you flatten the curve, you do not reduce the number of people who are going to get affected. You just spread it out over a long time. So I remember Barack Obama coming out and telling us, flatten the curve, here we go. But now it's all been forgot. And all that was about admissions and about death. Now, the interesting issue in Spain, I've seen what's happening in Spain. Again, what's happening in, if you go in for a hip operation and you have a PCR test, you'll be counted as an admission. So this comes back to the notion of understanding admissions within 28 days of an active infection. And do you actually have COVID? Or actually, are you in there for something else? Because COVID is a cluster of symptoms and signs related to a pneumonia that should be putting you potentially into ICU. And, I, and I'd like to come back to another really important point that we did write an article. In fact, the first article we wrote about this was in The Spectator. And it was in the New York Times on the weekend as well. And we're just about to put out another update of our review. When you do a PCR test, you basically amplify the amount of RNA, you put it into a DNA copy, and then you exponentially double that amount of DNA. And that's called the cycle threshold. And the more times you do that, the less virus you start out with. And this is important because you can basically pick up a single copy of RNA in an individual. 
There is a complete difference between you being infectious, which is about seven days from the onset of symptoms to about at day eight, you cannot find infectious people apart from the few people who end up on ITU who are worsening. We have found RNA shedding in evidence for 78 days because the RNA is only 20 base pairs long and it takes much longer for you to degrade the RNA. So when you're picking up asymptomatic people, you have no idea if they have active infection or did they have it two months ago? Because you intermittently shed this RNA and it's the same for all viruses. Now you can put in a threshold level which says you are infectious, which is about a million copies per mil in a sample, which is a cycle threshold of about 25. And if you do that, you can pick up the people who are infectious. But the way we're deploying the test at the moment is in a sort of ragbag way that says, whatever amount of RNA you've got on board, you are positive. And we are gonna see this move forward. And we've wrote this about two or three times in the, in the Spectator and kept moving forward the discussion, but it's now on the radar because there are 25 studies that have now looked at this and 10 have come in the last three weeks. So this idea is becoming more important. Well, let me ask you this, Professor. We've seen the, the figures Fraser gave us. We've heard your fascinating analysis of this. What are the policy conclusions for government now? What, at this stage in this COVID crisis, what policies should the government now follow, given right. your analysis and given Fraser's figures? So the first, the first issue is to understand the function of the test and trace program, which is to let the test and trace program work. But there's been a tendency for as soon as you see cases rising, with this arbitrary number of 20 per 100,000 and then 50 per 100,000, you go on the red list, policy intervenes. Well, at that point, you're saying the test and trace program is failing. So I've gone outwards and said, you actually have to hold back as politicians. What's the problem if a thousand people are getting the infection if you've not got a disease impact? Yes. The second issue then is you should use the data to really follow the impact of the disease. So if we see people with COVID increasing in hospital and ICU, not going in for a hip operation, actual with disease, that's the point at which you introduce local restriction measures. My third point is the amount of messaging, and I spoke to lots of people in Oldham here, is about 90% of people are completely ignoring the messaging because they just don't understand it. And actually, there are only three clear bits to me is social distancing, hand washing and being vigilant. And if we kept that clear, because what you're seeing is you may in university environments that we're so restrictive in university environments that by the time you come to the evening, there's 200 people in a house party who are not socially distancing. So they react in different ways because the message isn't clear. Mm -hmm. So that's two broad policies. And, and, and my third policy, and I think this is important, is care homes. I just don't understand why nobody's got a grip of this is an urgent area. We could reduce the deaths by 40%. So if we say there are 42,000 deaths and we can get rid of 16,000, suddenly you're looking at a radically different problem. And in care homes, places like Hong Kong had a very clear plan that we don't have in place. And so while we're doing all this test and tracing, we're still not testing people in care homes every week who go in there. We still have multiple agency staff transferring around different, different care homes. They didn't have a supply of PPE. They didn't lock down early enough. But all we have to do is when we make the switch is have an eight week period where you protect care home. Therefore, for instance, as we've heard of the, the agency worker who flew to Kent from Kent to the Shetland Islands while they were in lockdown to reintroduce introduce COVID, we ship 25,000 patients potentially directly into care homes at the same point. If we protected them for eight weeks, you could pay people, couldn't you? And just say, would you like eight weeks to stay in a care home? We're gonna give you a proper pay, stay in there for eight weeks. You don't need many skills. Yeah, you need the nursing, but you need to increase that staffing level. That's one practical area where you could get rid of 40% of the deaths. Amazing, Professor, I hope the government's listening to you. And I thank you for being with us. A fascinating analysis, but also some very practical policy 
uh, considerations that follow from it. Uh, Professor Hennigan at the University of Oxford, thank you very much for being with us on Spectator TV tonight. Let's turn out of Scotland, it's always with us. Uh, this week, Scottish Labour attempted to depose their leader, Richard Leonard, with four MSPs uh, calling on the Corbyn ally to quit before the Scottish parliamentary elections in 2021. They were really hoping to follow the lead of the Scottish Tories, who replaced their own leader with Douglas Ross, um, an ally of Ruth Davidson, last month. All of this points to a general crisis in the unionist camp as the SNP continues to dominate Scottish politics and the case for independence seems to be, according to the polls, more popular among Scottish voters than it's ever been. Now, James Forsyth in The Spectator this week said that this unionist malaise, if that's what it is, can be solved, he suggested, with an unusual move from number 10, start negotiations for independence. Strange? Could be. James, I know you're serious. Make the case. So, uh, despite the fact that the Scottish Tories have got rid of Jackson Carlaw, looks like Scottish Labour are finally going to get rid of Richard Leonard, it's still overwhelmingly likely that the Scottish National Party will win a majority at Holyrood in next year's Scottish Parliament elections. As um, Nicola Sturgeon's programme for government speech this week made clear, once she won a majority, she would go and demand a Section 30 order, allowing a second independence referendum. At the moment, Number 10's plan is just say no to that. Their view is there can be no legal referendum about Westminster's consent, and they can't lose a referendum that they don't allow. But those people in government who think most deeply about the union are beginning to wonder and worry about how sustainable that strategy is. That the big worry is this, is Nicola Sturgeon, who's a canny politician, chooses the right time to ask the question. And every time she asks the question and number 10 knocks it back, support for independence goes up by a point or so. And the question of whether Scotland should be allowed to have a referendum it turns into the issue rather than whether Scotland should be independent or not. And the worry is that if support for independence goes over 60%, you pass a kind of psychological tipping point. And any referendum when it comes would be seen as a confirmatory exercise rather than a debate. Now, I mean, the irony of this increase in support for independence is that the economic case for independence has never been weaker than it is now. The price of a barrel of oil is half what it was on the day when the referendum was held in 2014. In 2014, Alex Salmond would say, independent Scotland is going to join the EU and be part of the customs union and single market. So therefore, there will be no disruption to trade with the rest of the UK. That is now clearly not the case, because uh, if an in, even if an independent Scotland succeeded in joining the EU, there would, that would be in a different customs union to the rest of the UK. So there would be trade friction at the border. And all of these weaknesses in the SNP's case for independence are not being noticed or not affecting voters. So I think you've got to change the debate from being one about, the, about feeling, about the idea of independence to the realities of it. Now, one very high risk way, admittedly, of doing that would be to say to Nicola Sturgeon, OK, you've won a majority, you can have a referendum, but we've got to agree the terms first. You can't ask people to vote blind. We're going to sit down and we're going to work out, you know, what share of the national debt an independent Scotland would take on, what assets it would have, what currency it would use, what its relationship with the Bank of England would be, uh, how are we going to deal with the military bases, and how are we going to deal with cross-border trade uh, after independence? What would be the migration regime between Scotland and the rest of the UK? What would be the basis of citizenship uh, in Scotland? So force them to thrash out all of those questions. And then when it comes, the debate about uh, independence would not be about the idea of it, it would be about the realities of it. Now, I mean, there's some obvious drawbacks to this approach. The first is that, you know, having these negotiations could make things feel inevitable and demoralise the unionist side of the argument. Because you're talking about independence. Yeah. Secondly, um, the, the UK government would have to take a relatively hard line so as not to make independence look attractive. And you can see that that would be playing into that usual SNP narrative about how Westminster is always trying to do down Scotland. And they'd also love to frame this as Boris v Nicola, which is the, the frame that I think has worked so well for them during COVID and one of the reasons why support for independence has risen. 
But I think what it would do is it would re-inject economics into this argument about independence. Uh, a poll out last week suggested that by a 10% margin, Scots thought that not, didn't think that independence was worth it, but would be economically difficult. They thought that Scotland would be economically better off after independence. I think this is a remarkable assertion when you consider that Scotland would have the largest deficit in the Western world when it started out as an independent country. To join the EU, it would have to get its deficit down from over 8% to 3%. But none of those economic facts are landing for the unionist side of the argument right now. And I think they need to do something bold to focus the debate on the economic facts and the hard, cold realities of independence, rather than the emotional sentiments that Nicola Sturgeon has been so adept at tapping into. I want to get Fraser's take on this in a minute, but before I do, uh, James, wouldn't the problem with this be that the SNP would say, oh, hold on a minute, uh, the Westminster government is going to play real hardball. They're going to insist on giving us the worst possible deal so that when it comes to the referendum, the Scots will vote not to go independence because the deal is so awful. And they just wouldn't play that game. I think if Nicola Sturgeon refused to uh, negotiate the terms of independence, I think that would create a weakness for her. It would allow the union to say, well, you won't negotiate because you know that you can't make this work in practical terms. I mean, that would cause a, a problem for her. And also, she couldn't really spend her time accusing Westminster of being obstructive, of being the ones not allowing a second independence referendum if she was the bloc. And I think that that, that causes a problem. I also think that even if they, even if the SNP, one of the other um, challenges I, that people say is, look, well, what if the SNP negotiated and then said to people, yeah, ignore these terms, because as soon as it becomes reality and you vote for independence, London will soften and the terms will get better. I mean, that's quite a high risk game. So I think one of the things that we are learning from Brexit is that these, divor these political divorces are not painless and they're not amicable. And if you think that how hard it has been to break up a 40-year-old economic union with some political aspects, it does make you realise that breaking up a 300-year-old political, economic and military union would be infinitely more difficult and I think would actually be even more acrimonious. Well, I think divorce is always acrimonious. Fraser, what's your take on this? Well, I think right now I would have to admit to several things which people like me have got wrong about Scottish independence. First of all, I had thought that Brexit would make independence um, a less attractive option because you'd be leaving the customs union of the UK, the single market of the UK. That has not seemed to be the case. Um, I would have thought that the, the Alex Salmon trial, a lot of unionists thought that the sheer publicity of Alex Salmon um, in that courtroom day after day after day would damage the SNP more than it has. On the contrary, they look pretty much unstoppable now to get a majority, not just any old, any old parliament, but in a PR system that was designed to make sure that nobody got a majority. Then you, our unionists thought that when the North Sea oil um, collapsed, the Scottish financial figures would just be so big, the deficit would be so large, that it would be pretty hard to, to bat away. The Institute of Fiscal Studies only last week calculated that the Scottish deficit is close to 27% of, of GDP. Now, sure, pandemics make things big, but nobody's got a deficit anywhere near as big as that. But still, we see the support for independence climb higher. And the argument is made that Scotland's dire financial situation shows it needs independence because within the union, things are very bad. So unionists are basically in the rough the same position as Remainers were during the Brexit referendum, talking about, like, this is going to be very expensive, don't do it, it will cost you a lot of money. Um, then the other side say, look, this is not about money, this is about liberty, this is about sovereignty, this is about who we are as a country. So when unionists who've relied for so long on ammunition about figures and deficits, uh, they see this translated to the ears of uh, nationalist supporters thinking Scotland's too small, Scotland's too poor, Scotland can't do it. The unionist problem is how do you manage to get the practical issues back on the agenda? How do you come up with an attractive, positive case for the union, as well as persuading Scots that the practical obstacles to separation far outweigh? Now, what you need are articulate advocates for the union. Ruth Davidson's loss is pretty bad. 
There, look at the Scottish Labour Party as well. They're um, going through their another leader. You don't really have anybody up to the prowess and the eloquence of Nicholas Sturgeon, who's one of the most formidable politicians, I would say, not just in Britain, but in Europe. So unionists really ought to start panicking now. Now, Boris Johnson will say, look, doesn't matter. I don't have to give them a referendum. They can get a majority if they want. I can be like the Spanish government saying to the Catalans, no, forget it, you're not getting your vote. Like James, I don't think that's sustainable. I think if the SNP win a majority, they've got the moral right to ask for that referendum. And unions to better start right now thinking how they'd win it. It's going to be a big topic. It's not going away, James. Uh, it's an intriguing idea, and I can see the attractions uh, of it. I would suggest to you, though, the government almost certainly hasn't got the guts to go down this road, James. Yeah, I think this is a. I think this is a Downing Street that is aware that it that it is uncertain of Scottish politics, but it doesn't have a kind of fingertip feel for it. And I think the kind of risk-free option of saying no has an appeal. The thing I would say about this is, I think number 10's big aim is not to have a Scottish independence referendum, you know, capsize this parliamentary term. I think these negotiations would take a long time. And I think if, if, even if you embark on them, I don't think it's realistic to think that they would be finished between, in three years, between 2021 and 2024. So I think you are most likely looking at a referendum in the next parliament, uh, in the next Westminster parliament. And so in a way, I think, you know, that. I also think the union side need to realize this. I don't think doing nothing is an option. Mm. I think if you look at the demographics and the polling, uh, sentiment is moving against the union. And I think you need to find, I mean, I, 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 mean, I think I view this as a kind of, Win this referendum, you would then have a generation to build a new positive values-based case for the union. I think what we, I think what we have failed to appreciate is how um, devolution has separated the two cultures and really uh, eroded the basis of the union. I was, was very struck the other day um, uh, listening to a Today program. They do that newspaper review just after six o'clock, and this was just after the lockdown restrictions had been uh, imposed in in around Glasgow in the west of Scotland. And the presenter said, um, and they don't normally look at the Scottish papers, which is telling in and of itself, because of these lockdowns, we'll look at the Scottish papers in much the same way that you might say, well, because Emmanuel Macron has decided to lock down France again, we'll look at the front page of Le Figaro. And I think that common political culture has been eroded in a really dangerous way. I think we need to have a massive effort to get back to having a national conversation and a much greater awareness at Westminster of what's devolved and what's not. Um, I have to admit that I was writing a piece the other day on, on planning. And I mean, cue some frantic Googling to check whether planning in Wales is the responsibility of the Welsh Assembly or whether it's a reserve matter to Westminster. And I mean, the truth is, and this, and COVID has revealed this, you know, government doesn't know what's devolved or not. They, they assumed, uh, to take a topical example, with the quarantine measures changing tonight, they assumed that these quarantines would be UK wide. They thought that because it was to do with borders, it, it you know what Westminster said would determine the policy for the entirety of the UK. What it actually turned out was because these quarantines are a health regulation, they're devolved. So each bit of the UK can decide what to do. And again, I think all of these things added up are, are, are all eroding the basis of the union. You know, I mean that we all thought, I mean the 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 I mean, we, we, I don't think anyone can think anymore that devolution would kill nationalism stone dead, as well as maybe all of them. George Robertson telling me it was going to kill it stone dead. George Robertson? Yeah, exactly. The member of uh, cabinet minister, became head of NATO, told me that it would kill nationalism stone dead. And, and it's not done so. I mean, the union <laughs> needs to think of different ways to, 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 uh, to make and defend the, the union. I mean, it's funny that they actually, we forget that devolution, the whole devolution program was designed as a trap for the SNP to stop them getting anywhere near here. When it was decided that no party should get a majority, what they meant was the SNP should not get a majority. It's, it's extraordinary that we've ended up with the union probably in more peril now than it's ever been in. Well, the big test is whether Boris Johnson is the prime minister to save the, the union. And uh, parliament came back this week uh, Tory MPs have been very disgruntled over the summer. They're not happy. 
<laughs> and I doubt if they're any happier after the Prime Minister's performance at Prime Minister's questions yesterday, which was, in my view, as someone who has to sit and had to sit in a TV studio and watch PMQs every week, one of the worst performances I can remember of any Prime Minister at Prime Minister's questions at the dispatch box. So he didn't help himself uh, with his unhappy Tory MPs. They're moaning so much that the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, well, they went and talked to the Tory MPs uh, tonight. And of course, Katie Bowles had her tumbler to the door so she could find out what was happening. Katie, what's happening? Uh, well, I think you're right to say that the Prime Minister's PMQ's performance didn't really calm nerves. I think it did the exact opposite. Um, so we've had a, a long summer, which I think if you look at the summer recess, it didn't feel particularly relaxing for MPs, um, partly because they had lots of constituents complaining when they got stuck abroad or when they had to cancel their holidays. But then most recently, the A-levels fiasco, which really caused a, a, a lot of discontent in the party. So coming back, I think the hope had been in government to try and rally the troops so there are a few ways they plan to do this. So as you say, Prime Minister's questions didn't go quite to plan. Boris Johnson suffers from not having... Well, um, done his homework. Yeah, suffers from not having done his homework. He also suffers from not having that many MPs behind him. So because the chamber's still socially distanced, those who would cheer for him or rally him on aren't really there. And I think that does impact him. But then you go from Prime Minister's questions to a joint address to the new intake, the 2019 MPs, that includes the Red Wall MPs, um, where both the Chancellor and the Prime Minister tried to rev them up. Um, but ultimately, it's quite a sobering appearance from, from what I'm told uh, from MPs who, who were there. Um, the Chancellor's message was, you're hearing about tax rises. I'm not going to say they're not going to happen, but I promise you it won't be a complete endless horror show. Uh, it just might be a bit tricky. And then the Prime Minister backed Rishi Sunak up by saying, you know, it has been tough, but you know what, it's going to get tougher. So it wasn't the most optimistic, but I think what Number 10 were trying to do is try and uh, warn these MPs that, you know, things are going to be difficult, but therefore everyone needs to stick together. But I think probably where we got the biggest flavour or sense of where the party are was uh, Boris Johnson's appearance later that day um, or, you know, at, at the 1922 committee. And that appearance, I think one MP uh, in the room said, to me you couldn't exactly describe it as you know but a barnstorming speech um it wasn't nearly as bad as pmqs but that had already happened and the prime minister made plenty of jokes there wasn't too much social distancing going on in the room he said they were all cheek by jowl and actually looking at them not socially distancing it, it made him think of what he wanted to get to at christmas which is some sense of normality um so he wanted people to be able to be in the room like the tory mps were but but allowed to do that um and talked a bit about you know the the uh what's coming up but i think when you looked at the questions of MPs, there were a few quite hostile questions um so one mp suggested that Boris Johnson was a prisoner in number 10, um, to which Boris Johnson kind of shook it off and um, suggested he wanted to hug everyone. And then you had another question, uh, which an MP complained that when it came to number 10, how they handle the parliamentary party, um, they said too often MPs feel as though they have patients in number 10's hospital. The idea being number 10 will deal with them but they want them out, you know, they want them out as quickly as possible. Um, to which Boris Johnson replied, no, you're all doctors. You, you know, you're, you're very important to this. Um, but I don't think it was particularly uh, soothing to those in the room. And I think as you can see of what's going on in, in public, the MPs going out and criticizing, there's still a lot of discontent and just a light level of comedy from the meeting was because it was a 1922 committee, you have Boris Johnson and either side of him you had Graham Brady, the chair of the 1922 committee, and Charles Walker, vice chair. Now, Charles Walker's been very vocal in the media about his issues, and Graham Brady's known to be rather unhappy, uh, particularly following his area. Um, so Boris Johnson began by suggesting that he did realize there was some discontent, but he, he appreciated that, uh, that people weren't going public with that, which everyone took a little bit thinly veiled at the people next to him. All right, Katie, thanks.
You're watching Spectator TV. This is the week in 60 minutes, uh, sponsored by our friends at the NatWest Group. James, let me come straight to the heart of this. Are there a growing number of Conservative MPs beginning to wonder, not aloud, but perhaps to wonder in their mumbles, that Boris Johnson just has, isn't up to this job of being Prime Minister? I think the PMQ's performance was, I mean, I was talking to one former cabinet minister last night, and I think their sense was it was disrespectful to the Commons to turn up not having done your homework. I mean, I mean there are a lot of Tory MPs who would quite like to make Boris Johnson take Parliament more seriously. Uh, I would give you, uh, I wouldn't give you any odds better than even on before Christmas, the government either losing a vote in the Commons or having to pull one because it is going to lose one. The, the, the mood is, is yeah, and I think the, I think one of the things we're learning is that this we all assume that this majority of eighty on election night it was big, it was sizable, and we assumed that that meant you know political stability, and the government was basically going to be able to do what it wants wanted. I mean that's what the government thought. I mean the government imagined that it would be able to take on difficult big issues like planning reform because that majority was big enough ultimately to absorb you know, a normal sized rebellion. I think what we're finding is that this majority of 80 is, is much more like the majority that John Major won in 1992 than the majority that Margaret Thatcher won in 1987. MPs are uh, more rebellious these days, uh, party loyalty is less. And then I think a kind of underestimated factor is that there's toxins from both the 2019 and 2016 leadership contests are still in the Tory bloodstream. Uh, it used to be the case in the Tory party that he who wielded the knife never wears the crown. Boris Johnson in many ways wielded the knife on Theresa May and now wears the crown. And I think some of those who don't come from his Brexit wing of the party will struggle to forgive him for that in the, in the parliamentary party. Fraser, the, uh, people cut the Prime Minister some slack when the COVID crisis started. It was uncharted territory. Mistakes were bound to be made. We didn't really know much about it. They cut him some slack when he got COVID himself, very bad a dose of COVID. He was 50-50, whether he would have survived or not. So people understand all that, but we're six months into this now. And there's still, it seems to me, a lack of sense of direction, of competence, uh, of the government just knowing what it's doing uh, from the top down. That has to be, you know, we're a long way from the next election, but that has to be... That has to erode the government's position if they don't get a grip of this uh, before Christmas, I would suggest. It has in an important way that right now, uh, only a few months after winning a majority of 80, the government already has a problem handling parliament. So, for, for example, there was a, they, had a, they had a plan to do early release for prisoners that they had to abandon because they couldn't get it through parliament. Um, James uh, revealed recently there was a planning bill coming up that they're planning a rebellion for there. They won't be able to get their planning bill through unless they make some serious concessions. So already a government that should really be laying down the law to parliament is having to chop and change its policies because of how much um, of just worry there is, not so much about the prime minister himself, but about his modus operandi, about how he conducts his government. So rather than having cabinet members that he trusts and empowers, he's got a lot of power in number 10, and number 10 seems to be visibly buckling under the strain of this. One of the things that we've heard recently is, well, Dominic Cummings has been away on holiday, so that explains the chaos. Now, that's not very encouraging. I mean, this isn't a corner shop in Oktomakhti where if one guy's away, the whole outfit comes down. This is supposed to be the British government. So concerns are not so much about Boris, though there are concerns about him, but the whole way this government is being run. Katie, I'm gonna take some questions from our audience in a minute, in our final 10 to 12 minutes. but. Uh, what rumblings do you detect among Tory backbenchers? It's early days, they're pretty much a loyal bunch, um, but what rumblings, what concerns are they having about the Prime Minister at the moment? Well, I think there are several concerns and there's several things they can do. I don't think we're at the point where everyone's, anyone's thinking, you know, is, is Boris Johnson going to be Prime Minister in a year? Um, but I think there's concerns over uh, ultimately the Chancellor's plans for the budget, over spending. I think there are concerns really 
about how number 10 operates. And I think that question about whether Boris Johnson was a prisoner in number 10 hit on that. And I think that we might start to see an anti-Dominic Cummings movement if things keep keep hard. We know there's a, a lot of MPs yeah. <laughs> very unhappy of him since Barnard Castle. But I think that if you look at how that might manifest itself, um, one thing is, for example, you have projects very closely linked to that advisor. So ARPA, you know, investment in these things. And I think that depending how things go, I think when there is a, a lack of morale, people could try and move to try and stop those pet projects. I think that's one thing. Um, and I think on planning, I mean, uh, it's in a way a very important reform for the government, but speaking to MPs tonight, I'm even hearing that they're hearing that might be pushed back a bit um, until after the local elections next year, because it's too tricky. So I think we're going to start to see that anger in terms of votes being either pulled so they don't lose them or, or you know tricky when you get there well i think what people are going to be looking for is what what is the direction of this government now i mean it's been not sideways by covid every government has been not sideways by covid with the possible exception of the german government in western europe what's the direction what are the policies that are going to get britain back on track what does it believe in how much of the manifesto is it still going to implement and, and how is it going to direct a post-Brexit British economy? And these are big issues. And we've heard very little from the Prime Minister or the government about them. And we'll be looking to see what happens in the week ahead. Let's go to our audience. Uh, we can take some verbal questions. Julia Arthur has her digital hand up. Uh, Julia, let's have your question, please. So, uh, you look muted at the moment. I think you have to unmute. Nope, no sound there. Let's try Martin Wilson. Martin Wilson's got his hand. Ah, it looks like he's muted as well. So we're having a problem with uh, our uh, questions. I see all these little blue hands, but actually no one's able to uh, speak to them. Uh, let, let, why don't we try and sort, sort that out if, if we can, Katie? Let me come back to, uh, to you. All these stories about huge tax rises that are in the pipeline, other than that this is just the raise in the attempt to do them down, I don't really understand why they're going this route because there is no possible tax rise that uh, could do much about the deficit at all. The deficit's so huge. And if you did have a tax rise that could do something about it, it would probably destroy the economy. Yeah, you could make the standard rate of income tax 40%, you could make VAT, 30%, you just kill the economy in doing that. So why, why are they talking about, about this in this way? Well, I think it's confusing a lot of Tory MPs. And I think the biggest problem Rishi Sunak has when it comes to all these things being mooted is there is just not a general sense in the party that this is necessary, particularly right now. But I think it goes into, if you look in the long term, I think there's a real concern in the Treasury, not about trying to pay off this deficit, as you say, huge sums, but the fact that if you continue on the current path we are, particularly because the economy could in theory be shrinking if we go on this rate, um, we won't be able to maintain the level of spending that's a, that they expect, which is why I think we are looking at and hearing at these various measures, but they're all going to be very difficult. And again, I think there are questions as to even if we are definitely going to have, you know, have a budget even because everything's so unpredictable. But I think that the chance is going to have to convey this, but I think it goes down to the fact that there is a worry that the economy we are left with at the end of this is going to be smaller and therefore that's going to have big impacts on spending. And it's not something that I think is registered or the view in the treasury is, it's not registered with many MPs. Well, we know there are problems. The fiscal position is difficult, the interest rates are low. But the Tories have told us for 10 years that if they cut corporation tax, we get more revenue. Now they're telling us if we raise corporation tax, we'll get more revenue. Well, the both things can't be true, and they need to make up their minds what is true. Let me see if Luke Rake, who's got his uh, digital hand up. Luke, are you there? Would you like to ask a question? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, Luke, on you go, please. Hello. So my question is, given one of the key lessons learned from Brexit and Trump is that feelings matter more than facts, isn't it exactly the wrong approach to focus on Scottish finances in the next independence debate? Fraser. Um, I think it has to be both. Certainly the unionists lack an emotional argument right now. 
And for me as a unionist, it's entirely emotional. I think of the British government as something which made my whole my life story possible. My dad left school at 15, he joined the, the British military. You know, there are so many ways in which I think about what, why would you want to make foreigners out of our family and friends and, and other parts of the UK? But um, they're not used to talking this way. I think for, for decades, unionists have said, look, here's a spreadsheet, here's the answer, big deficit off the agenda. So yes, I think the emotional, the positive case needs to be made, but I do think we need to find a way of getting the practical issue salient again, because ultimately that is the trump card. And the Scots like to vote with their head as well as their heart. And so you're right, it is a double bound. Denise Butler, I see your uh, digital hand is waving at me. Would you like to ask a question? No, we seem to have lost uh, Denise. Let me try Caroline Stevens. Caroline Stevens, can we have you for a question? No, they're all very shy, these people. Let me just try one more. Andrew Richardson. Yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Oh, Caroline, there you are. I'm oh, here, wow. yes, okay. Well, um, Caroline, you're a star, let's have your question. Oh, somebody knows, somebody knows the technology here. Oh. Um, what I would like to ask is about the falsification of death certificates. Um, I've interviewed a few people who have had family members uh, die in hospital um, or even not even in hospital, but they've had uh, uh, they've been resuscitated and then then passed away. And they've actually uh, been put on the death certificate as dying of COVID-19, whereas actual fact they died from a heart attack. Yeah. Uh, this must surely distort the figures somewhat. Good question, Caroline. James, we saw that the government itself had to change the way it was calculating that, that if you had been diagnosed COVID, then you were a COVID death, no matter if you died a month, two months afterwards. And when it changed that, uh, suddenly the number of COVID deaths fell. It's been, I mean, I know it's been difficult to do. These are new ways, it's uncharted territory, but it's been a bit of a mess, is it not? Yeah, I think it was Carl who actually pointed out in a, in a piece for The Spectator that, that it, was in, it was an impossibility to recover from COVID in England. You could, you know, have COVID, recover, leave the hospital, be heading home to see your family to celebrate and be hit by the 38 bus and you would count as a COVID death. I mean, I, 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 think, this is a, I think this is an issue. And I think there is also, I mean, and I, as I understand it, it was, it was Carl's work that actually alerted the government to the fact that Public Health England was was miscounting uh, the number of deaths. And I think one of the things that is striking is, I think people right now, one of the challenges to the government, people right now are more fearful, I think, than they should be if they knew the precise numbers of what, of what is going on right now. I, I mean, I think it's very interesting in one of these challenges of, of, of getting people to come back to their offices back to use public transport. I mean, people have a feeling that if they get on a, a tube train, they are likely to be uh, in a train which has someone with COVID on it. And, and Carl would know more than me, but my reading of the statistics is you'd be highly unlucky to have anyone on your tube train who had COVID given the prevalence in the population right now. Let me try a few more questions. Susie Clark, can you hear me? Would you like to ask a question? Susie Clark? Yes, hi. 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 Hi, a uh, great start to Spectator TV, by the way, I'm really enjoying it. Um, I, I, as a company director of a, an events company in, in the West End of London, I'd just like to know what the thinking is behind putting corporation tax up when uh, so many companies in the hospitality sector are on their knees already. It's a very good question. Uh, Fraser, I don't quite understand this uh, either. Mr. Corbyn wanted to put corporation tax up because he said it would generate more revenue and he would use that money to pay for his spending plans. The Tories said, oh, if you put it up that much, uh, you won't get more money. Companies will leave or they'll find ways of avoiding paying it and so on. And now we have, we're being briefed that the Tories are thinking of putting corporation tax up. Well, what's going on? Particularly at a time when companies have got cash flow problems and are, are struggling to hold on to the employees, they have the points raised by Susie. Well, what's happening? 
Well, actually, my understanding is that corporation tax isn't one of the main things being considered in the Treasury uh-huh. right now. And um, th- there was some, we were talking with some of the times that, that was the case, but uh, they're thinking far more capital gains tax is far more likely to go up um, lowering the cost of much so, does it, Chris? It doesn't, re- even if you put it up to the level of income tax, it doesn't raise that much money. Oh, you bet. I mean, and you're also quite right, Andrew, in the Cameron and Osborne eras, we were told that actually lowering capital gains tax means more revenue. And by the way, it was actually true. If you reduce, I mean, if you reduce corporation tax, reduce tax on jobs, you get more workers. But interestingly, I mean, they've, they've ruled out uh, in the manifesto any taxes on income tax, on VAT. So where does that leave you? But only other a few more places where you can go to raise taxes. Um, and Rishi Sunak's trying to make this point. He's saying to his party, look, you guys want all this extra spending. Well, there's got to be a bill for it. And if we're ruling out all of these taxes, it only leaves us with a few other ones. Um, but might they break the manifesto pledge and just increase income taxes anyway? I suspect they probably will because they're never going to, even if, like we all know, I mean, Susie's quite right. Corporation tax isn't going to raise much money. Neither is capital gains. If you want a tax to fill a hole, you're going to have to break the manifesto pledge. So if anyone watching this thinks their income tax is safe for the next five years, I would um, suggest you think again. Very well. Let me take a final question. It's a written one from Chris, uh, I think I pronounce it Michael Zook. Uh, and James, I'll put this one to you. He, it's a simple question. What happens if the SNP just holds its own referendum regardless? It wouldn't have any legal standing. And I think the... Nicola Sturgeon has uh, privately always resisted that option because she thinks it would scare off, you know, sensible Scots, you know, who, who, who would just think it was a bit too radical, a bit, a, a, a bit too out there. And she wants to make independence a, a very respectable, almost establishment choice, in yes. the, or establishment choice for the new Scotlanders, uh, uh, to, to use the XMP terminology. I do think, though, that if, if the UK government keeps on saying no, I, I am, regardless of how many times the SNP wins majorities, I, I, think, I think this will end up in the courts. I think it will be, remember the porrogation case started in the Scottish courts. I, I think there will be an attempt to use the courts to try and force the government's hand. I think saying no won't, won't be the end of the matter. All right, we'll leave it there. Thanks to all of you who have joined our debut of the week in 60 minutes. As you can see, a little bit rough at the edges here and there, but we'll get the hang of it as the weeks go ahead. We'd like to know what you thought, what you think we should be doing, how we can improve it. I mean, certainly get rid of the three we had on tonight at the start. That would be a big improvement. We'll keep the professor naturally the only real professional amongst them. Uh, let us know what you thought. You can do so by emailing spectator TV at spectator.co. Dot UK. That's spectator TV at spectator.co.uk. But that's it for this historic event in British broadcasting of Spectator TV. We'd like to thank Nat West, uh, the Nat West Group, our sponsors, for being with us and for being supportive of this event we did tonight. We'll see you same time, same place next week. Stay safe until then. Bye bye.